In the Bible we read that Christians, as they live along from day to day, should not forsake the assembling of themselves together. In this way, the writer of the book of Hebrews puts it upon the heart of the Christians and the mind that uh, they should meet in fellowship with other Christians and they should gather together. And this is the beginning of the idea of how believers should belong to each other and fellowship with each other as members of what we call members of the church. And in our studies thus far, we have noticed that uh, the Christian is a member of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ and belongs to him. Also that he is member uh, one of another and that they belong to each other. This uh, thought, however, is that they are to come together. Not only that Christians are to belong to each other, but that they are to have fellowship with each other. They are to have communion with each other. And so in the idea of the church, is this idea of coming together for uh, communion in fellowship. This, this is, uh, idea is carried out even more uh, practically in the New Testament when you will notice that so many of the epistles are written to churches. Men, much of the interpretation of the gospel was given to Christians in the group the book of Romans was written to the Christians that were in Rome. And the book of Corinthians was written to the church of God in Corinth. And so with the Ephesians was written to the believers that were together and so on. Each one of the church epistles of Paul are written to the group. While we know that the truth comes to the believer individually, and he must individually belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he must individually receive the Lord Jesus Christ, yet immediately we're brought to the fact that he is to have this individual experience in fellowship with other Christian people, while the Lord does deal with him in his own heart. And it is a person-to-person -person relationship between the individual believer and the Lord, so that being a member of the body of Christ is first before we are members one of another. Yet... When the Lord would teach us and when he would bring ideas to us, he speaks to us in the group and the messages in the epistles are, as I say, directed to the, what is called the church. Now, the church in itself is never anything but the company, the fellowship of the believing people. And this brings to our mind that the very time when I receive my understanding of the gospel it's to be in company and in communion with other people. We may say in passing that that's a very good thing for uh, the man's, the soundness of the man's spiritual experience. You will remember that the very nature of man is such that it is not good for man to be alone. Now, this is not only true for a man personally and true for him socially, it's true for him spiritually. When he is together with other Christians, he is stronger and also he is kept from personal peculiarities. Uh, we all take note of the fact that when uh, uh, people live with other people in fellowship with other people and anyone that, that has, maintains daily communion with other people tends to be, strangely enough, what we would all call a normal person. But if a person for any reason is isolated and lives a life of seclusion, there is a tendency in each individual to become what the rest of us would call peculiar. It becomes strange. And this is not only because he's different from us, but actually he gets to be unbalanced. Certain things he has a personal interest in and large, and certain things that he personally is not interested in tend to uh, atrophy or to become smaller, with the result that this matter of communal fellowship in the Lord is important because in this being together with others, a better balance is struck. And while one person is more interested in 
one aspect of the truth. Another person is more interested in the other aspect of the truth. And the tendency is that that aspect of the truth that I'm most interested in, I'll emphasize the most. So if a group of us are together, um, Tom emphasizes what he's interested in, and Dick emphasizes what he's interested in, and Harry emphasizes what he's interested in, and the result is that Tom, Dick, and Harry have more than if Tom was alone or Dick was alone or Harry was alone. And God's arranged it this way, that no one of us should have the total responsibility for all that we even get. Some of it comes to us in fellowship with other people. Now, this um, immediately brings this to our mind. When you have people coming together, and a group of people are going to live together, you have something of a problem. If you just have people together without any kind of order, you have what eventually becomes a mob, and that's not far away from a riot. And that's the way those things go. And as soon as you have people together in a group, you must have some form of leadership. And this is borne out in our teaching in the Bible about the church. Because when this group of people come together in this fashion, the gifts are given to them. Gifts wherein God actually helps them along with their corporate or communal life. And the gifts are apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers. Well, you see, an apostle is a man who functions with other people, and a, and a, a, a prophet is a man who teaches other people, a pastor is a man who watches over other people, a teacher is a man who communicates to other people. Now, every one of these gifts are in the group in the social group, which bears out the idea that God has in mind that when the group come together, you'll have individuals with special gifts that were specially unable to do this. And then this goes a bit further. Not only are they gifted in this fashion that the, for the edifying of the saints and the building up of the church of God, actually, so that we may all grow into maturity from the function that the individual parts of the body bear upon each other. But this is also brought out in when the Bible says that Christians coming together, it speaks about how that they are builded together on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the chief cornerstone. And then comes a phrase like this, And so all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an habitation of the Lord in the spirit, and groweth unto a, a holy temple in the Lord. Now, all the building fitly framed together. Now, that expression, fitly framed together, is that what brings out to our mind that one has one place of leadership, another has another place of leadership. So there will be some who can interpret well, and there will be some who can perform, who can carry out practical activities. There will be some who pray well, and so on. And actually, again, the idea is that these Christians fitly framed together. Now, when you think about anything being fitly framed together, you can think in terms of a house. And Paul uses, however, he uses the figure of the body in the 12th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But I'm going to use the figure of the house because it'll fit in with our line of thought here at this point. And it does, this is carried out with the idea of the building fitly framed together and so on. When you think in terms of the building being fitly framed together, in order to be fitly framed, you must have walls and you must have a roof and you must have floor or it wouldn't be a house. But the whole house can't be walls and the whole house can't be roof. The whole house can't be a floor. You'd just have a pavilion. You wouldn't have a house. When you come a little bit closer, you have doors and you have windows and then you have blank wall space. Well, to have a house fitly framed together, it couldn't all be doors. If the whole house were a door, well, Paul would be the one to say, well, where were the walls? And if the whole house were a window, if it were all windows, although we do see some modern structures that begin to look like that, but I don't know what it would be like to live in them, because you wouldn't really feel like you had much protection and so on. And then again, if the whole, you must, between your doors and windows, have solid wall space, and I'm sure any of us that have ever been in any church or congregation are inclined to feel that we never lack for a solid wall space when it comes to that, just a blank wall. And yet, if you didn't have the blank wall, you couldn't have the building. And Paul would argue, from the standpoint of the body, that all members of the body have a function with each other. 
and those that you would least esteem are helpful or necessary for the other parts. And this is brought out in our understanding of the church. And so all these are builded together. They grow unto one holy temple in the Lord. Peter brings out a word wherein he speaks of us being uh, as lively stones, which really is to say as living stones. And immediately you think about that, you would wonder how in the world that could be. Well, when he uses the word living, he is bringing in the idea he means us as human beings, but more than just individuals, more than just units, it's units in action. In our living, we should be together. Well, the stones, what does that imply? As stones in the wall, as stones in the temple. That's Peter's use of the same figure that Paul calls this habitation of God. And so actually we find that uh, in the conception of the church, there apparently is in God's plan the idea that the church as a group of people should be gathered together and then they should be, as it were, structured together in a way that some have one function in leadership, some have another function in leadership, some have another function in leadership. And that adds up to this for us individually, that each of us will have some part to play. Each of us will have some function to perform. And the strength of the church will be if we perform the function. Now, if you think in terms of those stones in the wall, or you think in terms of bricks in the wall, you'll have to admit for yourself that the one important thing for a brick in the wall is for it to stay a brick. You don't want it to dissolve. And you want it to stay in its place. You don't want it to fall out. If it doesn't stay in its place, and if it doesn't stay for being a brick like it's supposed to be, the wall will collapse at that point. And so for a great many people, their function in the church would be to simply be as they are in themselves, with such faith as they are, but be sure to fellowship with other people and to join in with other people. And that will mean, too, that when these do come together and join together in their functioning, each will have to function as he sees fit. One has the feeling that he has a comment to make. The other one has a feeling he has a comment to make. Another one has a feeling that he would pray and so on. And those of you who are listening to will recognize, if you've read it, you'd think I was talking about the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians because that's the very idea of the church being together in fellowship and worship. One does like this, another does like that, another does like that, another does like that. Each one does a different thing, but they all cooperate together. This thing of being fitly framed together can be illustrated by a person's hand. If you were to think of your hand, which is composed of the five fingers, and yet the hand is more than just the sum of the five fingers. It has some function as a hand that no one finger could do. But this hand, in order to be a hand, the five fingers must individually function from their particular point. The thumb must act like the thumb, and the little finger must act like the th little finger, each one of the fingers must act his part. If for any reason anything should happen, that all these fingers should do exactly the same thing in exactly the same way, so that you'd just have all the fingers together, I wouldn't have a hand, I'd have a flipper. It wouldn't be a hand. To have a hand, it must be flexible, and the only way it can be flexible is for each one to have its part, and so it is in the church, where all the members fitly framed together serve as a, something which God can use. The Bible speaks of the church as being the temple of the Holy Spirit. We consider how the church is built together, a habitation of God. And now we want to bring this to our minds, that the Bible teaches that when the temple has been built, I'm not sure that the whole building of the temple takes place for this, and the figure may not be too helpful for us, but still this is the way the scripture puts it that when the temple has been built, there comes a time when the Lord himself comes to dwell in it. When the tabernacle, which was the first dwelling place of God among Israel, when the tabernacle was finally completed and every part of it had been put together the way, according to specifications, the way in which God himself had ordered, there came a time when, with everything in order as it was supposed to be, Suddenly the temple or the tabernacle was filled with the glory of God. And for no one could come in there because of the brightness of the glory that was there. 
that we have learned to call the Shekinah glory of God. Now, the same thing happened with the temple. When the temple of Solomon was built, and it had finally, every part of it had been put in place, and all the furnishings had been put in place, and the priests had been sanctified, and everything was ready, and the sacrifices had been offered, and they waited before the Lord, suddenly the glory of God burst in that temple, and for seven days no one could go in or come out. A great, impressive display of the presence of God in his temple. And so here now we find that in the early church, when the early church comes together and the Christians now come in fellowship together, they are to learn that they, in their communion, in their corporate fellowship, <clears throat> are the temple of the Holy Spirit. While we know that the individual Christian's body and the individual Christian's heart is the temple of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Spirit does dwell in every believer, there is nevertheless, according to the Bible, a strong emphasis that there is a sense in which the Holy Spirit dwells in the hearts of his people when they're in fellowship with each other as he cannot dwell in hearts of the people when they're not. Now, you will remember when the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, it was to the group, and the group were together. And you will remember also that the church was together, the group were together, of one heart and of one mind. And when you get that expression, one heart and one mind, you begin to see what fitly framed together means. They all had the same ideas in mind. doesn't mean that they were alike. Peter was still Peter, and uh, James would still be James, and John would still be John. Each one of the apostles would be in his own nature and in his, in his own size, so to speak, and himself, he would be himself. But there was a union and a communion. There was a fellowship there. It was more than a fellowship. There was a belonging there, a, a being together in such a way that the, that was the circumstance into which the Holy Spirit was given. You'll remember that when the Lord Jesus was here on earth, he made use of this statement, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. And while we know, according to Scripture elsewhere and all teaching, that Christ in you is the hope of glory, we understand that the Lord Jesus Christ comes to dwell in the heart of the believer. Again, we are made to wonder whether there ever is such a fullness of the presence of the Lord in the heart of the believer as there is when you're in company with other believers, which is a way of saying that if you will go to the, to the fellowship in a Christian church and you will share in the communion and the worship and the service of a Christian church, there will be a certain richness and a certain fullness and a certain extension of your experience in that group that you never have when you're alone. It would appear to be the way in which this comes. And we're strengthened to that with the idea that with the coming of the Holy Spirit, in every case where the coming of the Holy Spirit is recorded in the book of Acts, it is when there was a group. In Pentecost, there was a group. And later on, with those 12 uh, disciples that Paul found at Ephesus when he was traveling along where Apollos had been, and Paul found these 12 disciples at Ephesus who did not know about the Holy Spirit, well, when he taught them about the Holy Spirit and they received the Holy Spirit, there was a group. In every time where you will find the full, where it speaks of, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the word all is used. Now, individuals can be full of the Holy Spirit. Peter was full of the Holy Spirit when he stood before the council. And there were others that were filled with the Holy Spirit with individual emphasis. Ananias was full of the Holy Spirit when he was talking to Paul. But even so, this matter of the coming of the Holy Spirit and the entrance if, that he makes at that time is in Scripture. Uh, noted at a time when we are all together. In any case, the, um, uh, what we're interested in just now is that at Pentecost, if you will think of all the disciples gathered together, like all the parts of the building in place and the building finally built, then Pentecost is the coming of the Holy Spirit to dwell in the building that had been prepared. And he came to fill it. Now, from that time on, and so for us especially, it's important for us to think of this, that any time believers come together as believers and they have communion and fellowship with each other as believers, 
we can be very, very sure that there is with us none other than the Holy Spirit of God, that he himself will be there. And that has certain implications for the church. If we're trying to understand what it means to have the Holy Spirit in the fellowship of the church, we're again reminded in the Old Testament of such a simple statement as this, Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. One of the things the children of Israel had to learn when they were called out of Egypt to dwell in the land of Canaan, that when they were going into the land of Canaan, God was going with them. And so in Israel's experience, when they were organized, the 12 tribes were organized in the, uh, in the camp, whenever they settled down in camp arrangement, the tabernacle, which was the presence where the presence of God was, was in the center of the camp. And the 12 tribes arranged around three to the north, three to the east, three to the south, and three to the west. This was dramatizing and figuring for these people that uh, God himself is in their midst. And he would have them understand that he was there. And then in that part in the Old Testament where it tells about, where it reveals the fact that God said that I myself will dwell in the midst of them, he told them that they would have to keep their camp clean. And all the instructions about sanitation in the book of uh, Leviticus and in the book of Numbers, where they are told distinctly how to keep the camp clean, you will remember that the reason they were to keep the camp clean is because God would be with them. And because God would be with them, they had to be clean in their habits. Because God would be with them, they had to be clean in their speech. They had to be clean in their conduct. They had to be clean in their worship. Everything they did had to be clean. Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. This idea is carried over into the New Testament. And here again, when you think about us being uh, members of the body of Christ and build together as a habitation of God, each one of us a stone in the wall of the temple, so we're all built together the habitation of God, then we'll have to take this into our minds, that as God is holy and is going to dwell amongst us, we're to be holy. And you'll remember Paul reasons about that when he says uh, that uh, we're to come out from among them and be ye separate because God's going to be with us. I will be a father unto them and they shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord God Almighty. Wherefore, cleanse yourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and the spirit because God's going to be in the midst. And so this concept, the temple of the Holy Spirit, actually pushes all Christians to having a feeling that their daily life should be under a certain discriminating supervision by the very presence of God. There are going to be things that are unfit and things that are unclean and things that are unsound, things that are improper, simply because God is in our presence. This is implied in various ways. But now, in addition to that, not only does this concept, the temple of the Holy Spirit, bring to our minds that we in our living and in our conduct should be careful to be pleasing to the sight of God, but there's also something about the actual function of this, uh, this matter. When the Holy Spirit comes to be in the hearts of the Christians, the Holy Spirit is primarily given to witness. And whenever the Holy Spirit is given in the New Testament, there's always some form of performance. He is never given for the individuals just to enjoy him. And he is never given for the individual believers just to be able to contemplate with enjoyment what God has done. The Holy Spirit is always given for service. There's always something in which we are to function that will bring ministry of service to some other people. And this will come in various ways. When we're thinking in terms of service, we must always remember that the dimensions of service are to God and to man. There is a perpendicular, a human heart toward God as the human soul, the believing soul, toward the Father in heaven. That's involved in service, and we are to serve the Lord. And there is the human individual believer and other human individual believers. We are to serve each other. And there is a responsibility of this Christian to the people on the outside. There is a service to the render to the people on the outside. And the Holy Spirit given to us impels us in all these directions. Now, toward God, we're moved to worship. When the Holy Spirit is in the heart, we are moved to prayer. And when the Lord Jesus taught his disciples to pray, you will remember, he taught them to pray, Our Father, 
Well, the word our is social. It's group. You can't say our father unless you've got some other people. Because if you are the words, you'd say my father. Now, we all recognize that for the individual Christian, that there is a sense in which he can pray to God as my father. He can have that in mind. And that is private, personal, and very important and very real. But when our Lord Jesus Christ taught us to pray, he taught us in the group. He taught us our father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And it's give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses. Always there is the plural, which means to say only this much, not so much you need to be in the physical presence of others, but you're conscious of the fellowship of others, and you're aware of others when you worship. And this comes out because the Holy Spirit is given for function and performance in the group. And again, may I suggest to you, the scriptures do not encourage us to think that the individual is called out in isolated performance. It is in group performance, even though I may have a singular responsibility in that. And I may, on my own, have to stand out on my own. But I'm bringing them all with me when I come into the presence of God. So, toward God there is prayer. And toward other people, there is everything that's involved in uh, the idea of communion and service. In this fellowship with other Christians, with the Holy Spirit from within, there is comfort. It's comfort one another with these words. It isn't so much be ye comforted by this as it is comfort one another with these words. And every one of us in spiritual experience will know that there is a great strength to having fellowship with even one other Christian person. And when two or three are gathered together, then verily, there the Lord is in the midst. Because it's when you share with other people that you derive more comfort from the promises of God. And in sharing with other people, you are built up in the edification of the Spirit. And so with reference to the service. And so God has arranged to come himself and dwell in the hearts of his people as a people.